Hi, I'm Barney Schwenke, the pastor here of Faithway Baptist Church in Leesburg. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to watch this sermon video we're about to show you. My prayer is that God will use this message, along with you being part of a local Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church, to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. Trust that the following message will be a blessing to your heart. Well, if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to Hebrews chapter 4, I know Phil kind of already gave you a little bit of a, a prelude here to the service where we're going to be going as far as our text this morning. But Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, is probably one of the most profound passages of Scripture in all of the Bible concerning the Bible itself. Uh, how do we know what the Bible is? Do we believe it is the Word of God? Why do we believe it's the Word of God? And hopefully this morning we'll be able to give you a good foundation as to why the Bible should be the most important thing in your life. I read a survey this morning that said that less than 15% of professing Christians read their Bible every day. Okay, I don't know what the statistic would be in our church. If we could let you answer a survey anonymously this morning with no fear of the pastor you know, cracking down on you, how, how often do you read your Bible? Is it a daily part of your life? And I'm not asking you to guilt you, but I want you to see this morning from God's Word that the Bible is so important to your life because not only can the Bible save your soul, but it can change your life on a daily basis. I'm not sure if you've been following the news lately, I and mean, there's a lot of news that's been going on, and it's kind of not, not a lot of good news, honestly. But uh, as a sports fan, um, what's happening in Los Angeles with the Los Angeles Dodgers, uh, coming up here in a couple of days, they're going to be having their prideful day. And uh, on Prideful Day, they invite all of these different homosexual groups to come and be a part of their uh, different things that are taking place. And they've invited a group that is openly blasphemous against God and uh, the people of faith to be a part of this ceremony. And it's really sad. I mean, it's just to see what is going on in our culture today, how far we have gone downhill. And, you know, someone says, well, has it ever been this bad before? Well, I hate to say this, but it has. And this is not something that's new. Maybe this level or just the fact that it's broadcast this way, but there's always been people that have mocked the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. George Whitfield was a 17th, I'm sorry, 18th century evangelist. Before the Revolutionary War, he would go around and he would preach, and he would preach in Connecticut and New England and all around preaching the Word of God. In fact, if you've ever had the chance to go to the Bible Museum in downtown D.C., highly encourage you to do so, by the way, they have a, a, a recreation of the soapbox that George Whitfield would stand on when he would preach. And they say that George Whitfield could lift up his voice like a trumpet and preach to 10,000 people at one time without any amplification. I mean, that's, that's the voice that God gave him. And when he would preach, people would get saved, and they would be in tears, and they would repent of their sins. But there was a group of people that followed uh, George Whitfield around, and they called themselves the Hellfire Club. And they would mock Whitfield. When he would go to one town, they would follow him. And they would set up camp right across the stage from where he was. And they would openly just ridicule his faith. In fact, on one occasion, there was a man by the name of Thorpe. He was mimicking Whitfield uh, to his cronies. He was up on his own soapbox. And, and what he had done is he had memorized one of Whitfield's sermons, and with just brilliant accuracy, he, he imitated Whitfield's tone and his facial expressions. Uh, like Andrew Baker, you can imitate me pretty well. I've heard you do an imitation of me before. So that's exactly what George Whitfield, this, this guy, was doing. And he gets up there in front of all of his buddies. He's mocking Whitfield. And yet, as he's reciting the sermon that he had memorized, according to the story, he was so pierced by the words that he was saying that he sat down and he was converted on the spot. Why? Because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 this morning is our text, and I'd like you to see here, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12, the Bible says this, For the word of God, the word of the Lord, the word of God is quick and powerful. And sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing us under of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. How can God's word change a soul? How can God's word change my life? Because the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, there's a lot of people out there that will criticize the Bible. You know why they criticize the Bible? Because the Bible criticizes them. Nobody likes to be told what to do. No one likes to be told that their lifestyle is sin or what they're indulging in is wrong. They don't like to hear that. 
And yet the Bible is unique from any other book that has ever been written in the history of the world because its author is God himself. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so this morning, we've arrived in Hebrews at verses 12 through 13. And we've been working our way through this book. And when you get to chapter 4, verse number 12, the first word of that verse is the word for. And whenever you have a, a wherefore or a therefore or the word for, it's bringing in the previous passage of Scripture. And so you always want to go back as a student of the Bible and you want to see what that word for is there for. Well, if you go back in verses 1 through 11, the Bible is telling us as Christians not to give up, to press on, to labor on in our faith. Why? Because, verse, verse 12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So that's the context there. So this morning, I'd like you to see, first of all, in verse 12, the living word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Notice, first of all, the Bible says there in verse number 12, the word of God is quick and powerful. Now, when we think of something that's quick, we think of a, a fast car. That, that's not that word there in the Greek. The word there means alive. So the word of God is not stagnant, but it's quick. It's alive. The Bible alone possesses the power to transform hearts, to renew your mind, to bring life where there was once death. Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. How is someone born again? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Just as God spoke the universe into existence, so his word has the ability to bring about a new life in each and every one of us. I love what D.L. Moody said. He said, the scriptures... We're not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. Now, a little bit of context. Some of you know who D.L. Moody was. He was an evangelist after the Civil War. He preached in America. Great revivals took place. And he was based outside of Chicago. Uh, Moody Bible Institute is there. Bruce used to went to Moody Bible, I believe, for college for a little bit. And Moody Bible Institute, Moody Church, has, has reached many, many people with the gospel over the years. And D.L. Moody, as an evangelist, he would show up in town and he would preach five sermons from John 3 16 for God so loved the world on Monday night that he gave his only begotten son on Tuesday night that whosoever believeth him on Wednesday night should not perish talking about hell on Thursday and on Friday he would talk about how you can have eternal life he would preach the gospel real simple straightforward well the theologians in Chicago the the pastors that were the stuffed suits the guys that had a lot of knowledge but they were never born again well, those guys didn't like D.L. Moody because he would preach and people would get saved. And they would basically see all of these people that were in their, in their pews on a Sunday morning go to his revival meetings and get born again because they weren't hearing the gospel on Sundays when they were being, when they were being taught by these seminary professors. And so D.L. Moody, a little bit of context there to that quote, he's saying, look, the Bible is an important book. But the reason the Bible was written is not to make you theologically smarter, but it was written to change your life. And so, my friend, I hope every single day the Bible, God's Word, is a part of your life. No, not only is the Word of God alive, but the Bible tells us here that the Word of God is a, like a sharpened sword. It's likened to a two-edged sword. Now, if you know anything about the Romans, they perfected the art of warfare. And they had a short, maybe it was about 18 inches, some, some people say two feet long, but it was a short sword that was two-edged, and it was so sharp, it was capable of slicing a human being in half. Th that's what they would use on the battlefield. And just like the Romans perfected the, the sword, the Bible, the author of Hebrews is saying, has that same ability to pierce the division between the soul and the spirit, exposing the true condition of our hearts. You know what the Bible does? If you read the Bible, it will expose your hidden motives. Can I ask you a question? Why are you here this morning? Are you here because your spouse guilted you into it? Are you here because you're afraid that if you don't show up that I'm going to call you and say, Hey man, missed you. Where were you? Now, why are you here this morning? Is your motivation to worship Jesus Christ? You see, the Word of God will reveal your motivations. It will reveal your intentions and your desires. And as you submit to the Word of God, what the Bible begins to do, like a sharp sword 
It dissects our thoughts and reveals the truth in our hearts and in our life, what we really truly are. Some 75 years ago, there resided in one of the temples in Tibet a Buddhist priest who had never met a Christian missionary before. He had never heard of anything of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he had never seen a copy of the Bible. One day, while he was going through something in the temple, searching for something, he came across a copy of the Gospel of Matthew that had been left there by a native who had received it from a traveling missionary. He, he was very curious, and so this priest began to, began to read the Gospel of Matthew. And when he got to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 8, he paused, and he thought about that verse. For Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And according to the missionary that told this story, he said that this priest, this Buddhist priest, stopped at that verse. And even though he knew that nothing of the righteousness of God, he was quite knowledgeable about the fact that he was a sinner. That he would never be able to see his maker because he was not pure in his heart. Month after month after month, he would say to himself, I shall never see God for I am impure in my heart. And slowly but surely, the Holy Spirit deepened within him an awareness of his presence until he saw himself as a lost, vile sinner who was completely unable to save himself. After continuing in that condition for more than a year, one day the priest heard about a traveling missionary who was, they called him a foreign devil, who was in a neighboring town. He was giving out books that were talking about God. The same night, the Buddhist priest fled the temple and he journeyed to the town where the missionary was residing. Upon reaching his destination, he sought out that missionary and at once he said to him, Is it true, sir, that only the pure in heart will see God? Yes, the missionary replied. But the same book that you are referring to tells you how you may obtain a pure heart. And he talked to him about the Lord's atoning work and how the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Quickly, the light of the gospel flooded his soul, and the, the Buddhist priest found the peace in his heart that passes all understanding, and he was born again that evening into the family of God. My friend, that is what the Bible can do in your heart. And if you're a Christian here this morning, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, if you've been born again into God's family, that, that miracle has taken place in your life as well. Now, maybe it's not as dramatic as the story I just shared with you about that, that priest in Tibet. But there's been a moment in your life when you recognize that God loved you in spite of the fact that you were a sinner and he came into your life and you were born again. So the word of God, verse number 12, is quick and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And notice what the sword does. It discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The word there for pierce in the text means to go through. It means to penetrate. It, it, it's, it's when someone takes a knife and th if they slice their finger, that's not that word here, okay? It, it's to cut off, to lop off. Um, example, this may, maybe some of you might get queasy from this, but you know, in the fall time around hunting season, for some reason, um, deer like to trespass on our property. And that's not good. We don't like trespassers. And so from time to time, we, you know, my son will pull out his gun and he'll shoot the deer that kind of wander onto our property. And the reason we do so is because we really enjoy venison. So if you happen to visit our house in November, December, January, February during hunting season, you might look in our garage and you might see a carcass or two of an animal that's hanging there. Now, I understand some of you love animals. I get it. We love venison. We, we love the meat. In fact, the reason that we oftentimes will use the meat is because of one of the former members of our church. Maybe some of you might remember Lee Acker. He used to sit right over where Peggy is at. He passed away a couple of years ago now of cancer and right before he passed away. I was at his hospital room there in, uh, in Reston Hospital, and we were talking about the Lord, and we were just talking about how wonderful it will be when we all get to heaven. And uh, he said, you know, Pastor, before I go, before you go, he said, there's something that I want you to have. He said, when, when I pass away in the top drawer of my filing cabinet, there's an award-winning jerky recipe. I want you and Isaac to have that. And so he bestowed that to us. He bequeathed that to us upon his death. And so we have that with pride, and we make his famous jerky every year. So if you want to get upset, you can blame Lee. He's in heaven right now. But I say all that to say this. When you walk into our garage and you see those animals hanging there, they've been skinned, they've been gutted. Yes, it's, not a, it's a dirty, disgusting thing to do, but the result is some amazing venison jerky that, unlike you probably never had in your life. If you want some next year, we'll make some for you. 
the Word of God does that. Like, like we have to split open Bambi with a very sharp knife. That's the idea here, right? That's exactly what God does to us when we read His Word. The Word of God is a discerning book that penetrates our hearts. He uncovers the thoughts and the intents that are revealed therein. If you were to open up your heart this morning and reveal the contents to the world, if they were just to spew out, would you be embarrassed by what's inside? The Word of God brings conviction, illumination. It guides us towards righteousness and away from a sinful life. It allows us to see ourselves for who we truly are. And my friend, I believe that's why only 15% of evangelical Christians in America read the Bible. Because they don't want to be exposed for what they really are. They, they like dabbling in their sin. They don't want to be exposed to the truth. A couple of weeks ago, we had a family, a couple that was visiting from Florida. They came to Leesburg to visit some family here in town. And they stopped by church on Sunday morning. And after the service on the way out the door, uh, the husband shook my hand and he said, you know, this morning, the message that you preached, it really stepped on my toes. He said, did someone tell you that I was going to be here this morning? <laughs> and I said, no, but the Lord told me what to preach this morning. And he put the words in my mouth and he brought you here today, made sure that you were here so you would hear it. And my friend, that's exactly what the Bible does, right? It's alive. It will change your life if you let it. So that brings us this morning to verse number 13. We've explored the fact the Bible is alive and it, it breaks down the condition of the human heart. I want you to see the next thing that the Bible does. The living word is our accountant and our judge. Hebrews 4.13 declares, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest or made known in the sight, but all things are naked and opened to the eyes of him of whom we have to do. Verse number 13 tells us that there is coming a day that you will not be able to avoid the accountability of God. Nothing in creation can escape the scrutiny of God's word. It exposes every hidden aspect of our lives. It leaves absolutely no room for deception or evasion. I can make you a promise here this morning based upon the, the word of God. You may think that your sin is secret here on this earth, but I guarantee you in heaven right now it's an open scandal. God knows everything. Nothing is hid from God. In fact, Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 26. He said this, Fear them not therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil and the good. So what does the Bible do? Well, we saw in verse 12, it reveals every action, every thought, every intention. And therefore, verse number 13, it makes us accountable for our choices. You notice verse number 13 again. In the text, there's a, shuttle, a subtle shift in verse, between verses 12 and 13. Verse number 12 talks about the Bible. Verse number 13 is talking about the author of the Bible. The word reveals, the Bible reveals, that we will one day stand before the ultimate judge who will assess our intentions and the actions of our lives. In fact, verse 13 says that we will stand naked before him. There is nothing in our lives that can be hid. You know, the first time that we see that word naked mentioned anywhere in the Bible, it's in Genesis chapter 2. And the Bible says that the husband and wife, Adam and Eve, were both naked and they were not ashamed. But after they sinned in the Garden of Eden in chapter 3, you know what the Bible says? Genesis 3, 7. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. Why? Because I was naked and I hid myself. You see, Adam sewed fig leaves to cover his nakedness. This morning, you could have the best and the finest clothes that money can buy. But in the eyes of God, all of those disguises are stripped away and God is going to meet you where you really are. Which leads us to the latter part of this verse, an invitation to transparency. Ponder the phrase there, it says, with whom we have to do. What does that mean? With whom we have to do. The only time in my life I've ever had to stand before a judge is traffic court one day. I was going 74 and a 65, or at least that's what the nice police officer told me I was, or he wrote on the ticket, right? I was going a little faster than that, but he 
nine over was great. So as I got the ticket from the police officer, I looked at it, and it said that I had to appear in court on such and such a day, and I was going to stand before the judge, and if I didn't pay that fine, which I paid so I didn't have to go to court, that was the only time that I've ever been summoned to court before was to pay a ticket. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have to stand before a judge because I had committed a crime, a serious crime. That would be a very sobering thing, to have to stand before someone else who has the power to sentence you to spend years of your life locked away in a prison cell. And the same is true here. That's what that means. With whom we have to do means we will stand before a judge, but not a mortal man, not a lawyer who's advanced through the system and now he's been made a judge. No, that's not the idea here. This is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Solomon or Koheleth, whoever wrote the book of Solomon, or Song of Solomon, he said this, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. My friend, if you're here this morning, one thing is for sure. You will stand before God one day. If you're a Christian, it will be at the judgment seat of Christ. It's called the Bema seat. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Romans chapter 14, and other passages of Scripture talk about that. If you're a non-Christian this morning, a non-believer, you will stand before Christ at the great white throne judgment. Revelation chapter 20 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this morning, I don't want you to stand before God as the judge who's going to sentence you to hell for all of eternity. I want you to stand before God as your Savior, as the Savior of the world who loved you and you've been bought with the blood of the Lamb of God. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. Okay, can I show you from the Word of God this morning that the Word of God is something that you must have in your life. A personal relationship with God requires personal responsibility. Every time you read the word, you're exposed to the pure light and the pure revelation of God, and it calls for a response. So don't be dece deceived, my dear Baptist church attending friend this morning, to whom much is given, much is required. Everyone here will give an account of himself before the judge of all the earth one day. And that is one appointment that you will not be able to miss. I know there have been times before that I've had a doctor's appointment and I, you know, I just don't feel well enough to go to the doctor that day. Or I postpone it because I just really don't want to face him telling me i got to lose a little bit of weight or i got to change this or i got to do... I don't want to do it, so I postpone the appointment. You can't miss your appointment with God even if you wanted to. Faithway family, the Word of God, verse 12, is alive. It's quick and powerful. It's sharper. It, it discerns, right? It can, it can cut to asunder the, the flesh. It knows the heart. And it's unavoidable. It's a book that calls us to accountability but it offers the assurance that if we follow its principles, it will transform your life. So this morning, can I just encourage you to submit yourselves to the power and the authority of the Word of God that you will be continually transformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Let's hold fast our profession of faith and trust in the promises of our great high priest, Jesus Christ. Which, by the way, the latter part of chapter 4, we're going to get to here in a moment. If you know Christ as your Savior, seeing then that we have a great high priest, right, we... We know that we're going to be able to get through the trials of this world. We'll see that next week because of Jesus Christ and our high priest and the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So let's bring it back to our present day. You and I would all agree probably that the challenges that we are facing in our world today are unprecedented. We're facing battles like never before. So what are we going to do? As Christians, we have two options. We, need, we can either cower before the world and the schemes of Satan... Or we can boldly declare, thus saith the Lord, this is what the Bible says. I want to bring you back to verse 12 one more time as we close. The Bible says, for the word of the Lord, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I want to remind you that a sword is not a defensive weapon, but an offensive weapon. We are engaged in an all-out war, my friends. A war for which there is no end. Let's just say, you know, let's just say that you were able to get Congress to pass laws outlawing all of the things that Christians decry. And let's just say that our culture today was a lot more God-centric than it is now. What then? Do laws change human hearts? No. You could enforce a law from Congress, or you could ask all of the police officers here in Loudoun County to arrest people who don't think the same way, act the same way that we do and we want them to do, but that will not change their hearts. 
the only thing that will change someone's life is the Word of God. And it seems like, as I look at the culture today, Satan has thrown down the gauntlet before our generation. He's not only weakened our attack because he's made Christians, you know, I don't want to get canceled, right? I don't want YouTube to ban me. I, I don't want, I'm afraid of all, right? I don't want to be marginalized and I don't want people to think bad about me. So I'm not going to open my mouth. And when you look at the statistics, they don't paint a very pretty picture. So you say, how are we going to survive? How is the church of Jesus Christ going to survive? My friend, it, it requires every person within the church to have a walk with God. You get on fire for God. You boldly proclaim the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. In my humble opinion this morning, the only way that there's going to be revival in America is if the church of Jesus Christ will get their nose back in the book and start obeying and following the principles that are here. When there's a revival in our hearts, then there will be a revival out there. Don't pray for revival in America unless you're willing to do the hard work yourself. And so remember, the best offense is always, or best defense rather, is always a strong offense. It's going forth in my heart, allowing the word of God to penetrate me. And as God changes my life, I rest in the promises that God's word never fails. That's one thing that you can take to the bank. Jesus never fails. God's word never fails. John 3, 16, it will never fail. Someone one time asked Alexander the Great, how do you conquer the world? You know what his response was? Some of you who have studied him in history. Simple response. You conquer the world by, quote, never turning back. Never turning back. So my friend, let's take some inspiration this morning from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Let's march together as a church family towards the unwaver with unwavering determination towards the truth of God's word as we face these challenges together. And yes, as a church family, we unite together. But as individuals, we recognize that each member of the army of the Lord has a responsibility to keep our nose in the book, to keep our lives pure and clean before the Lord if we're going to see victory in our lives and in our nation and in our culture. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the word of God that it never fails. And Lord, as we think about the direction that our country is going in, my heart breaks. We see what's happening all around us right now, this month especially, how the world just openly embraces the things that brought down Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the, the lifestyle before the flood. And we say, how long, Lord Jesus, until you judge the world? And yet, when we think about our own lives and the sin that has crept in into my own life, into our lives as a church family that we just play games with and we kind of ignore because we like indulging in it, oh Lord, I pray that you would help us to expose that through the word of God and that your Holy Spirit would convict us and that we would see a true revival of sorts take place in our hearts, in our lives as individuals. Lord, do a great work through Faithway Baptist Church and other churches here in Loudoun County, Northern Virginia. So many people need the Lord. I ask you, Father, that you would start that work in us and use us to accomplish something great in the kingdom of God with the time that we have left here on this earth. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, I don't know how God's spoken to your heart. Maybe you need to get your nose in the Bible and not be one of the 85% that doesn't read God's word. Maybe. There's sin in your life that God's exposed, and you know, no one else does. It's secret here, but it's a scandal in heaven. God knows. God knows. How long are you going to dabble in that sin? And then maybe you're timid and shy, and you just haven't opened your mouth and told people about Jesus for a long time. Perhaps God's telling you today, it's time to go on the offense and take the gospel of Jesus Christ to your friends, your neighbors, your family members who desperately need the I don't know how God's spoken to your heart, but as Jill takes some time to play the piano, would you examine your heart and ask the Lord to do a work in you today? Let's pray together as a church family.
Father, I pray that as we look at our world today and the statistics are grim, that we would not be discouraged, but Lord, we would press on for you. I ask you that each and every one of us here will take to heart the things that you've shown us today from your word. And then we go into a world tomorrow that is lost and dying, that we would do our part to bring someone to faith in Christ, to boldly declare that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father but by him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Hi, Pastor Barney Schwenke here with you again. Thank you so much for watching uh, the video today and taking time out of your schedule to listen to the Word of God being taught. My prayer is that this message will truly help you in your walk with the Lord. I tell our church family all the time, God's will for your life is a daily walk with Him. So if you have a Bible, make sure you read it. If you don't have a Bible, reach out to us here on our website and uh, we will make sure we send one to you. We want to do everything we can to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. If you found the message today to be a blessing and you have the means financially to be able to help us, we definitely would encourage you to do so. It costs money to be able to produce these videos and to be able to put these out there on the internet for you. You can go to our website, faithwaybaptistchurch.com, and in the upper right-hand corner, you can click the word give. And uh, there you can make a donation to the media ministry of our church if you so choose. But hey, we do this for you. We want to be a blessing. And so thank you again for joining us today. Like we said, if there's any way we could be a help or a blessing to you or your family, the contact information is there on our website. Please let us know. We'd love to be able to help you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Have a great day.